Uh, we're very pleased, and it's a very special uh, thing to have uh, acclaimed screenwriter and filmmaker, Kirsten Sheridan, fresh from LA, um, which she'll tell us all about, I'm sure, uh, to come and give this masterclass, um, hosted by a uh, screenwriter and uh, co-chair of the Board of Women of Film, Film and Television, Lauren McKenzie. I won't do any intros, you'll probably <laughs> do that. Um, but I also want to let you know, my name is Vanessa Gilday and I'm a board member of Women in <coughs> Film and Television. Um, and just also in the room, we have Susan Liddy, co-chair of Women in Film and Television. Just for anyone who doesn't know, she doesn't <laughs> talk about <laughs> that. <laughs> She's an incredible <laughs> academic and lobbyist, and um, I've known her a long time, a long time, and is a great advocate for gender equality for many, many years. And we're very lucky to have her on the board. Um, I'd also like to just point out Gemma, who's our executive administrator, whipped new to the job. Um, it's just that we want everybody at the at drinks afterwards to come up, say hello, say who you are if we don't know you already. Um, I don't think there's any other board members. I don't think. Really. No, but there may be some more at the drink. So please come up, tell us who you are if you don't know us, and we'd love to find out more about you, members, and people who are thinking of becoming members. Um, and that's all I really wanted to say. Just um, thanks everybody for coming, and I'll hand over to Lauren's expert. Yay. for a fabulous intro. Uh, welcome everybody. I understand that uh, there's plenty of other temptations at this time of year and I'm very glad you're here and that you're delaying gratification because it will be why, I promise. Uh, in about an hour and 15 minutes. So, um, I'm going to run through Kirsten's um, bio even though I think probably everybody knows this and I've kind of, as I went through it, I realised I came across Kirsten's uh, short films long before I knew who she was, and I remember them, you know, and it was, you were always striking, even from the very beginning. So, you, I got, you studied film and television at UCD, film production at IODT. I actually wrote the UCD thing, but I didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> I did like a two-week course in screenwriting, and now it looks like I did like some huge UCD. That's thing. your first degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Now, the PhD I have here. <laughs> Okay, that's yet to come. <laughs> um, I've got. <laughs> I'm not sorry. Yeah, you know, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, there's been five short films. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Two award winning ones Patterns and the case of Magella McGinty. Right. Uh, and Magella McGinty's script was by Mona Regan. And then you also won the Miramax Best Irish Screenplay Award. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, a while back. Back. that's a while back. But that's how you launched yourself to yeah, a yeah, quite was starry. Cash. Hard cash, it was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Um, your first feature was Disco Pigs, starring a young Killian Murphy, mm -hmm. who was written by Ender Walsh. So I'm, it's also, I'm crediting writers. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, that went to uh, premiere at the Berlin Film Festival and uh, to great critical acclaim and now uh, won numerous prizes, which is too many to list. Although at Berlin, someone did say in the, the Q&A, you know, when you have those Q&As and someone said, why did you make this film? <laughs> <laughs> that was a wonderful question. <laughs> and you said... Oh, it was a long fucking answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was all now. <laughs> Um, uh, 2003, you co-wrote the screenplay for, um, again, critically acclaimed, um, Autobiographical in America, and nominated for an Oscar, Golden Globe, and a Writers Guild of America Award. I would love to say about that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, in terms no, of writing. Yeah, it's a weird one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, won the National Board of Reviews, Christopher Award, and the Broadcast Critics Awards for Best Screenplay. Then your first US feature film, August Rush, in 2007, written by Nick Castle and a few other people. I never met Nick, but yeah. Um, you know, it sounded like it looked like it passed on to various people. Starring, um, you know, Jonathan Rhys Myers, Kerry Russell, Freddie Highmore, Terrence Howard, and Robin Williams. You know, kind of fabulous um, film to launch yourself in the US and uh, a lot of New York locations. Like, it was a real mm. solid American feature <laughs> film. It was fabulous. 
And um, 2009, he came back to Ireland and he set up a factory in the Docklands, which is a, a real um, ambitious, idealistic, kind yeah. of um, enviable collective of artists, of directors, where John Carney and Lance Daly, yep. uh, with Maureen Hughes, who's a casting director, and her actor studio. And you had mixing rooms, sound rooms, and so on. So it was like trying to do everything from very first base to the end product. That's right. It was a, like a 10,000 square foot freezing cold building with a broken boiler. But it yeah. was a lot of love. <laughs> yes. I was there. I tried, yeah, tried to get a room there. Um, and while you're in the factory, you um, directed Dollhouse. But yeah. that we should talk about that a little bit later because the whole process was experimental and improvisational and you're yeah. working really closely with your actors. Yeah. Right? Um, and so that was an exciting project. I mean, it's clear, like, it just from running through all of this, uh, Kirsten has an amazing range of um, projects that she has done, subjects and format and approach um, over the years and, and, of course, doing them all, you know, so well that you're getting awards for it. And I think it's, you know, it's quite apparent you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that too, <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, you're still young as well, that's the other thing to remember. Um, there's a few projects that, are, that uh, I was checking out that do, things are announced, you know, in the press, you know, that are in development. So there's been variously um, an Olga Corbett yeah. um, biopic, Amy Winehouse biopic, a four-part TV series about Cleopatra, and uh, and a more recent feature about um, GA. GA, um, Jim McGuinness, yeah. 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 And you're currently living in LA. Yeah, for five years. <laughs> five years. Are you staying there? For a while, yeah. Yeah, I moved over to specifically kind of look at the TV world over there, so that's been really interesting, just pitching, to, you know, to that, to those kind of rooms and those amount of, like, that amount of people and execs and, yeah, that world. Very different, different and, your films. And are you pitching your series ideas or trying to get onto other people's series? Both, both really. But like when you go to pitch your own TV series ideas it, over there, you realise that it takes the same amount of energy as honestly as writing at least one, if not two feature films. So yeah, that's I one, that's one yeah. pitch and that's completely free work. So, you know, it's, it's so I've been doing uh, writing features as much as possible over there as well to just pay bills and stuff, mm. but then developing TV pitches and writing spec screenplays to kind of break into that world. But it's it's very specific and it's a major learning curve, very steep learning curve. I can imagine. And the, are the spec scripts, <laughs> are they spec TV scripts for a particular series? So you may no. Different... Well, a lot of people do that, but I, I wrote a spec a comedy pilot actually funny enough I, on the morning of the election results <laughs> I woke up and had to tell my kids what happened <laughs> and that we were still living here <laughs> and uh, at that moment something flipped in my brain and I went from drama to comedy overnight because <laughs> I out thought you couldn't compete. Necessity, yeah out of just headspace um, so then you couldn't compete with the level of drama in the news um, mm. and so I thought actually if I could write comedy and get everything I was trying to say in through that door, um, probably very black comedy, um, <laughs> that that would be an easier way to, to reach people, you know? So, yeah, so I wrote a spec pilot comedy and then sent that out. And how's that going? Good, well, you kind of get a job from some of those things, you know? Mm -hmm. You might not get your show picked up, but as, as we were saying earlier, like, I go to a lot of talks at the Writers Guild where I'm sitting there, you know, and there's show, a whole panel of female showrunners here, which is kind of amazing, but, you know, someone said, um, the uh, getting your own TV show is the equivalent of winning a pie eating contest where the prize is more pie. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so it's kind of be careful what you wish for, it seems like, because it just completely takes over your entire world and you have to be ready for it. Um, and you have to absolutely be in love with what you want to say, um, which you realize after doing like, you know, three months of free work on something, you're like, oh yeah, you really do have to love it. There's no point. And it seems so simple and that's the kind of advice your agents give you and you're like, yeah, yeah. But when I first <laughs> went over there, I went over there with the attitude of like, I can do whatever you need. So what do you need? You know, what color does the car have to be? Okay, we'll make it red. Okay, no, maybe we'll make it green. Um, Cause I wanted to get a job simply. Mm -hmm. um, but that's more of a staff writing position. 
So there's very different kind of boxes. Um, if you want to develop your own show, you have to go in absolutely knowing what the colour of the car that you want to sell is, you know. Um, and if you if you divert from that, you're kind of, it's not good, you know. So but then if you go in as a staff writer, you have to be completely malleable and and ready to collaborate and, and drop <coughs> ideas for someone else's ideas. And Looks like you're really easy going. And yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I meant to say earlier, we will we will stop questions, okay? So yeah. like some of this might we'll keep talking about pitching because we were, um, we were talking earlier about uh, more well actually we might talk more about what you're saying now actually <coughs> the idea about depending on what you're pitching uh, it's not just about the content, it's about how you put yourself across. So whether it's, they, a lot of people, certainly with um, your own series, as you're saying, or even with feature scripts, is the producers want to hear someone say, I've got this, mm -hmm. you don't need to worry about it, I know exactly what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. whether it's true or not, and everybody's kind of convincing themselves of that, <laughs> yet they're all uncertain. Mm -hmm. But you were talking about that's exactly the same in the TV market. So yeah. If, yeah. I think when it's, a <laughs> yeah, if you're looking at being a showrunner, I mean, that's such a specific job, you know, and I think actually, you know, I, I was trying to sell my own show ideas for five years and, you know, I worked with various companies and, you know, many different reasons things don't happen and whatever, and I'm still kind of at that. But in actual fact, when I look back on it now, I'm going, God, I actually wouldn't have been ready. There's no way, you know, to take that on. It's mm -hmm. such a humongous uh, responsibility, you know, so, so... It's interesting, you have to be, I mean, I kind of feel like feature films are, are so different to TV land, you know, and, and I find, I mean, personally, I kind of feel like, I was, and we were talking about watching features with teenagers mm -hmm. and how they see everything coming, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, we were talking about that trick that you do like 15 <laughs> pages into a script where you go, oh, I'll have someone say like, you know, this is what I really want to do with my life. And then you'll come back to that at the very end of the movie and that's what they're doing or, or that's what they're not doing and it's a little trick and like I'm watching that with my kids and they'll be like, oh, let me guess, that's what happens at the end of the movie. <laughs> and you're just like, oh, cringe. You know? And so they see all of that structure. They're so yeah. savvy that I feel screenplays are utterly limited now, you know, because they have to follow some kind of certain structure, but it's a three act structure, which is a hero's journey, which, you know, we're in women in film and television here, but to me, is 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 a male story and mm -hmm. it's, it's been that way since they wrote that structural myth thing you know and so, but for me and this is, might just be what i've convinced myself but i find tv is a female medium because to me it's like a spider's web of structure it's the world and it has all of these you know like that's how the writers rooms look they look like a spider's web mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. don't look like a straight line with obstacles and redemption and resolution so so to me, that's just much more interesting because you kind of go deeper into that part of your brain, you know. But it's also, I think that the writer room encourages different voices, you know, and that some multifaceted yeah. um, characters and storylines because it, 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 everybody's collaborating, which is actually, again, it, whether it's a cliche or not, but it is true of women, you know, known for collaboration. Yeah, yeah, and you can branch off and do all these different you know it's kind of like it becomes a 3d image to me or something you know like the the whole tv world it's like the world that you're in is so important uh, in, in, mm. whereas feature films i think it's what does the character want you know but but for tv it seems to be what is the world and you know recently it's been a little bit difficult i think over there because the bar is so intense like i went to I went to pitch something which I thought was wonderful, not not even my idea, because it's true life, but it was about the, the invention of the lie detector machine, um, which was actually invented by, with the grandfather of it is William Marston, who wrote Wonder Woman, um, and is also a psychoanalyst, and they've made movies about him, and this menage a trois relationship that he had, and all very interesting. But, you know, I went to pitch that to places like, not even the, the HBOs and the Netflix, is more like the, the ones that, you know, like the Nat Geos and the History Channels and those mm -hmm. kind of things. So you go, this is a good fit. And <laughs> then you go, wow, this is, they're like, it's like Masters of Sex, but that was picked up 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like things are so extreme and ideas over there are pushed so far that you have to be going it, like it's, it's, it's so extreme. You know, that, that's just way too tame right now. So that's and kind the of... The story idea. The story idea is too tame, yeah. So it's, you know, like... It, it, Kind of that Marvel thing is a problem, I think. You know, it's like, okay, it's set on a spaceship. Okay, it's set on the moon. Okay, it's set, uh, they're cannibals, actually. You know, oh, it's actually a, a, 
a third dimensional reality show. You know, like it's it's the high concept ideas are so up high mm. that the normal ideas of just drama and people <coughs> every day can get kind of lost in the mix, you know. And um, so I think that's you have to it's that can be difficult, you know, because that's where I'm drawn to. It is it's I mean I'm I'm thinking of those sort of series because I do I love the relationship series, right? the yeah. TV series as well. So, um, but I mean, this is us is doing well. Mm. But that's the type of series that we haven't seen for a long, long yeah. time. Mm. Yeah. But I'm wondering, I'm curious as well about because some of it blurs because I think that's an issue with uh, feature film as well in terms of the type of stories that have been done and sold. You know, you have big and glossy and high concept they are. Yeah. And the smaller dramas. Mm -hmm. You know that people that we recognize um, mm -hmm. and a story that, that is about something that would be very close to us and could be just as intense in the stakes uh, as life-changing mm -hmm. as a superhero movie, right? Like a Moonlight or a, yeah. you know, those kind of level of, yeah. Moonlight or Private Life, which is yeah. on Netflix. There are a few, few things appearing on Netflix, which yeah. is interesting. So it's sort of crossing a line between um, TV and feature film, right? or feature films appearing on TV, mm -hmm. I guess. It seems uh, like that's interesting, though, because I think, like, um, those those two extremes and it's funny because it, it comes back to the women thing again like I was recently thinking about Fleabag and <coughs> some other TV shows um, Better Things Pamela Adlin an FX show and it's interesting because the women characters have to completely unmask themselves and be so naked and show so many flaws that probably a male audience have haven't really seen before you know and mm -hmm. like that's who Fleabag is and that, that's why it did so well but it kind of makes you think you know wow so is that the op is that the option you know what I mean is that what we have to do or else we have to go over here and you know do those higher concept things you know I'm not sure though I have heard the quote and I think it was Joe Lapato who said if you want to be original it needs to my there's a couple of years now if you want to be original just write about women right but I think with Fleabag I think it's been plenty of um male stories or films or TV where there is, there is a vile kind of um, nakedly honest um, no holds barred male character right and there's yeah. plenty of them you know Jack Nicholson does a good line in them and uh, like Paul Giamatti and so on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Fleabag I think is actually just it's just the female version of it and yeah. I think that's what stands out it was honest and bold yeah you know? and then shameless right? yeah yeah not she easy, but she was shameless yeah right? so yeah. and and uh, more power to it, it's this kind of a genius in it. Yeah, because it's, it's been so rare. Um, do you have, are you pitching feature film ideas, like original ideas? or? Mm. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, a little bit, but it's quite, it's quite tough, I think, out there, you know. So, I mean, you know, I have a couple of feature <laughs> films that are set in Ireland that are in that middle ground territory that are very, very hard to attract funding to, you know? So I kind of, I mean, we were, we were just talking about this. It, it slightly feels like Ireland can fall between stools because, you know, Netflix is going to Netflix Spain and HBO are off opusing, opusing? opening offices in um, Eastern Europe. And, and yet, you know, it doesn't seem, I don't, I don't feel it that, that it's here. You know, they, they haven't come here and picked up movie ideas, certainly not a lot of them. Um, so it's strange because we speak English, there's not that local language production, which I think comes back to RTE, you know, like if, if RTE behaved in the same way that um, the Danish TV stations behaved, um, mm. I think it would, it, would, it would grow a very specific voice that you could then brand. And that would be an authentic voice. There's nothing wrong with that branding, you know. So, but I think we haven't been given the opportunity at all to grow that or maybe a little and it might be getting better and I understand the reasons why etc cetera, etc cetera. but the, the fact of the matter is for writers and directors and producers that option isn't really there certainly not enough it's um well I think it's changing actually sorry so you good about De well no <laughs> oh the worst. No, I, no, 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 it's landscape that's changing it, you know Danish um Danish television is wonderful but I, I have had a conversation with a executive and vice president of DR a couple of years ago who it felt that um, the, the broadcasting, broadcasting in the way that we have been broadcasting and a national broadcaster producing programs for a national audience that it was just it was going to go by the wayside you know? anyway yeah right you know within our lifetimes anyway, mm. as it is um, and that streaming and Netflix and so on and the international audience and content is, is 
the way it's going to go. So it's funny though, because Amazon just said recently, you know, I think it was the Amazon exec, someone there at, at like this big, huge TV uh, conference said the biggest mistake people make is going into her and saying um, this this will work in in five different territories. This is a global universal mm. story. That's actually mm. the biggest mistake. She wants people to go in and say this is one hundred percent Spanish yeah. and it will work in Spain. And then it has its own life after that and a knock-on effect. But but she was actually saying it has to be utterly authentic to that country, <laughs> which is interesting. Travel. I think that's always yeah. been true. Always yeah. been true. It's been hard to get across to people that uh, the more local you are, the more international, the more universal. Yeah, be, if you can get it there, right. Be yeah, authentic. Yeah. Um, but you suggest you say, like there's there are plenty of Irish creatives that have made it overseas, like yourself, you know, and then Lenny Abramson, Lenny Abramson, and uh, and the actors and so on. But do you feel that there haven't been films in, in later years that, that have represented a, a, like an authentic Irish story? Oh God, I think there's been loads. Yeah, and no, yeah. absolutely but brilliant it's ones. It's like whether they travel or not. Really. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean. I mean, it's just so hard to get those features made right now, you know, and, and I suppose just on a, not even on a philosophical level, but on a very simple funding level, I, I think Ireland yeah, falls yeah. between stools. That, that's what worries me, you know, um, that I, I don't see people like going, okay, so what are the, I don't see Netflix and Amazon coming here going, what are the ideas? I haven't felt that anyway, you know? Yeah, well, so. funding is always a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting that in The Factory, in terms of how you set it up, um, did it work as you wanted it to work? Well, actually, it's funny because we set it up as a writer-director co-op, a filmmaker's co-op, yeah. or an artist's co-op, or whatever. Um, but it became more, much more an actor's studio. Yeah. You know, so that was where the energy was in Ireland at that time. It mm -hmm. felt like, and um, so we just went with that flow there, you know. And, <coughs> and so we ran the actors' course, but you know, for, for so long and, and the studio for so long, but a lot of great actors came out of it and, and I got to film out of it as well. So, so it was, yeah, it was quite, quite a wild roller coaster ride for, for three years, that one. <laughs> In the making of Dollhouse, you worked with the actors, but did you also work with Lance and John, you know, in terms a little, of yeah, yeah. what you were doing? Yeah, I mean, like nothing would have happened in there without everybody knowing about it and being kind of involved. But, mm -hmm. but I guess I just thought like the idea of a factory film was a certain type of film. And so instead of me having full control and writing a script, I just decided to do a 10 page outline and not tell the actors what the story was and reveal it on camera. So that was really fun on the set because you're like an uber puppet master you know yeah. um, <laughs> total control free um and so that was that was great because it the set felt very alive whereas before i would write a script and then the set was just about you know like being disappointed every day that you didn't have enough money to get what you wanted you know <laughs> like that's filmmaking so i was like let's try and let the set be the alive part you know so uh yeah it, it was it was a lot of fun is it i like uh, are you saying the actors didn't know anything about what they were going to do no, when they turned nothing. up? Nothing. It was great. Yeah. I mean, they knew they knew exactly where they were in that moment. So you know, Shauna, the main, the lead, knew she was pregnant because she would, have, as a character, known she yeah, was pregnant, yeah, and she yeah. knew she was hiding that from everybody. And she knew it was her house, and she knew she was hiding that from everybody. But when the door knocked, nobody knew who was going to come in. You know. Oh, okay. So um, that was fun. You know. I didn't realize it was quite as improvised as that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were, it was terrifying for the actors. It was so yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it's exciting at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And certainly out of that, um, Sean Kerslake has gone on to do yeah. and Jack things. too. Jack, yeah. <laughs> and then Barry, <laughs> Barry Kyogen was in that factory. So it, it was a great. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize that. It was that. a great, um, great mix. Yeah, yeah. Right. Certainly, that's a lasting legacy. But the funny um, thing is, is with the actors in the in the factory, what we what we really learned, or what we really tried to push home, was was to be uh, not sit, not not waiting for permission from anybody else, you know? So it was mm. all about pushing them. And actually, oddly, a lot of them have become into stand-up. So it's strange. A lot of, actors. Yeah, a lot yeah. of the actors in that went into stand-up as, as just like a writing and trying to find themselves and trying to find <laughs> what they're about and just to take control of, of their own life and writing one-man shows or, you know, or mm. making short mm. films. So they branched out much more, you know? Yeah. Which I see... Like any time I get I get calls from people who are like I'm going to move to LA and I'm a writer and what do I do <laughs> and I'm on the phone for like an hour chatting away and but like it's funny because when you look over there you're like okay like 
like insecure what is is a, a girl you know uh the hbo show but it started as like this small youtube channel and high mm -hmm. maintenance started as short vimeo uh little clips and mm -hmm. like a lot of those things do come from that you know so so that's why I think it's so important for actors to not just look at themselves as actors who have to wait by the phone for a director to tell them that they got a job, you know? It's a terrible, so. my son wanted to be an actor for yeah. a long time, and I was like, I thought writing's pretty difficult, but an actor yeah. has to wait for permission to do the thing yeah. that they love, it's a terrible situation yeah. to be in. So it's yeah. good advice. Yeah. But I'm curious actually, what is the advice that you give to people who are in <coughs> Yeah, which isn't to say that anybody should be thinking. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I don't know. I guess the good thing about moving there in some ways or moving outside of Ireland, even for a little part of your life, I think, is that you do have to, you do get a slightly different perspective, I think, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, you're pitching to people who literally have no clue what you're talking about. So you have to widen or something the way that you tell stories, you know, or and, and also be more clear in some ways, you know, because there's no shorthand be between you, you know, so it's a... That's an interesting thing, but what was your question? <laughs> what, what is the advice that you give oh, right. to writers or actors, um, actor writers who come to who it want depends. to where they yeah, and start working? It depends what they want, because I moved five years ago and I kind of wish that my agents had said, okay, you need to go straight in as a writer's assistant. I know you're 30 whatever, but you need to, you know, that, that, that there's a real career there and it's fantastic, Within you know? TV, in, you yeah, in yeah. TV, there's a real career of, um, of starting as a writer's assistant and then going and just moving up that ladder and then you are an executive producer or a producer within a few years. And then there's the other option, which is, you know, sitting at your kitchen table every day from nine till three writing, which is what I did, which feels like going to the gym every day. Um, it's that much fun. It's good for you. <laughs> um, but it does exercise that muscle. And so, you know, then you just go in and, and you keep pitching and you just, I mean, we were talking, I was talking about this with a writer recently. Um, and I, because uh, you know, you say the words like made it, and I'm like, I so don't totally do not think that about myself <laughs> at all, you know. And I don't know if any writer really does at any point in their career, you know. But, um, but I was saying to her, what, what is the difference? And, and I do think it's just about the not giving up part of it is the only difference, you know, because I've like in the last six months, to year, I have seriously considered absolutely changing careers, you know. As we were talking yeah, about when yeah, you yeah. when you write the script and you send it out and it's just silence. That's the hardest mm -hmm. thing for an artist because art is about connection. And then, you know, they say write a hundred percent from your heart, put everything into it, and then you do, and then you send it out, and then there's silence. And it's the baby is left on the doorstep. <laughs> Absolutely. And the breathing cold. Yeah. And then you have to let let the whole thing go and get very zen about it. So it's weird because you have to be utterly passionate. And then utterly zen. <laughs> it's um, about com comp <laughs> compartmentalizing. The um, yeah, I like I've, I I learned over the years to actually have a few projects on the go and just once I delivered a script, it was delivered, and I just go on to something else. So I yeah. wouldn't, I couldn't afford to be sitting around thinking and waiting to yeah. hear. I knew at least three months. Yeah, I knew at least three months where nothing had happened anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, be very lucky if someone can make, uh, make contact yeah. um, earlier than that. What do you do about, um, well, the question I was going to ask for, for later, but you talk about being Zen. Is that easy for you to be Zen no. about? No. <laughs> I don't think it's easy for anybody. But Have I you develop skills um, and how to manage it and stay sane. Um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I'm trying. Um, I'm trying, but. Um, I think going straight on to something else is a smart thing, you know? Yeah. So I have 15 projects on my fridge that I look at every day, and like there's an underline for the That's two that are paid. <laughs> so they're underlined there at the top. And then there's an asterisk for the ones that are feature films and a dot for the ones that are TV, and you just look at it every day, and you kind of have to let one go for a little while while it's in that, in that yeah, yeah. waiting for response mood, and then like fixate on something else, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Putting the money first, I think, is like something you just have to do. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Money for but hopefully, they're the, the passion and the money like end up together. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were just saying, you know, you get a job and you're like, I think I like this, and then like halfway through draft one, you're like, I'm so in love with these people, or you know, you get yeah, very. Into it doesn't them. matter where the yeah. project starts, and even if you were just doing it because you're desperate to pay your bills, you you still end up giving as much as yourself. 
to yeah. your project as, as something that was totally your own yeah. idea. Yeah. It's the same whether the project is low budget for friends or you know yeah. someone else is paying big money for it. You know, yeah. It's just it takes everything. Yeah. And I don't I don't know how to do it differently. No, um, no, no. There's there's I don't think there's a way. Probably the ones I got paid the least amount least amount of money for are, are I took longer. You know. Yeah. Just for whatever yeah. reason. So yeah. <laughs> and that's how it goes. What about in terms of um, projects that you do? I suppose we've talked in a way about we're adaptable, right? We're always looking for work, and sort of you can you kind of um, attach yourself to many different things. But when you are sitting down to write a script, are there any elements that you feel like you need to decide on first? Like, is, is it the theme, or is it the character, a world, or like anything that you haven't? I mean, it's funny because what they keep asking for over there, whether it's feature or TV, is, uh, you know, you start every pitch, and sorry to keep coming back to pitches, but it just, it, it, it speaks to me a lot about, about, you know, whether you're trying to get commissions or, or going into the film board or whatever it is, but they, they're quite obsessed with um, the personal connection. You know, and, and, and again, so it... it like your personal yeah, connection. Yeah, mm -hmm. so if you have that, it gives everybody a real sense of relief, you know, and, and actually it's quite true then, you you end up going, actually, that's that's very true, you know, and, and it takes so long for you to find your voice, you know, and we were just talking earlier about how it's it's always, you're always finding your voice, you know what I mean, and for a huge chunk of my career, I think now, and I'll say this again in 10 years, but looking back at it now, I go, wow, I was writing what I thought certain characters should behave like, you know, and, and it takes a long time to unlearn that and strip it back and and start again from a different place, you know, and, and let it, like, it's, it sounds all so cliche and so easy, but all of those things ring true, you know, that it does come from somewhere deeper inside rather than what you think is, is expected or, or what this character should do or you have seen do already on film for 20 years. And, you know, I, I used to have female characters specifically um, that and one day I did do that that uh, experiment where you just call that character a woman, uh, you know this male character, <coughs> just call that character a female name and reread the script and mind blowing. You know mm. I was going why how did I not make those choices in the past for a female character? You know, so that's kind of scary because that's when you think wow I've internalized this um, lack of a voice for years <laughs> and it's coming out in my writing and then you have to smack yourself to get out to wake yourself out of that you know we are all products of our environment like it's unavoidable so you know when the people talk about unconscious bias mm -hmm. you know, we all have a exactly. bad in terms of uh <laughs> writing what's familiar to us you know yeah for right or wrong the way I, actually i think this is slightly connected as well in, term, in terms of uh writing women right and whether there's an element of that we have absorbed about our own behaviour. But also, when you're talking about um, voice and how it's changed over the years, I do think your voice, one voice, can be true at the time. Like yeah. I've gone back, I've been invited to go back and rewrite a project, mm. you know, from like five years before, or mm -hmm. the, you know, it's gone into turn around, it's now mine, I can do it, I can mm -hmm. go back to it. But I'm actually, no, I'm no longer the person that initiated mm -hmm. Um, that project and had had that idea and I felt passionately about that subject. I've actually moved on. And yeah. there's some some things I wrote. The script I wrote about parenthood terror when I had a baby. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, the character might have been an adult, um, like adults, but it really was about parenthood. But I was sort of asked to go back to it over the years. It was one of my <laughs> sort of longest lasting script. It will never be made. Mm -hmm. It was well loved and got me many jobs. Um, but I couldn't really rewrite it. There was a certain point that I changed and, and, yeah. and learned a lot more. So I, I, I do wonder about voice. Yeah. Is, it, is it something that we're constantly trying to find that true voice or actually we are many different people in our lifetime? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. You can't really discount it. Like, it's it's a valid thing for what it was at that moment exactly. in time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you can look back at things. And, and you can see a through line too, you know. But... But I guess it's just getting closer to some kind of truth. And I'm married to a psychotherapist. Yeah, so yeah, so there, there's that. Um, you know, a Lacanian psychotherapist at that. So talking about spider's webs and diving deep into things and looking at them and taking them apart and going, why am I writing that? You know what I mean? And constantly asking yourself that question is, is an interesting uh, 
<laughs> and exhausting. Well, it's been never, yeah, it's never ending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, does your husband read your scripts? Uh, when when I pay him. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and babysit, when I promise to babysit. Yeah. You know, he does, and it's great because, like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's character motivation and it's um, people say things and, and what's really going on is absolutely, completely different, exactly, you know. Yeah. So that's the fun part of it, you know, using dialogue to not, to, to say the opposite of what's actually going on in the story, you know. <laughs> that's the fun part. Does he recognise you in your scripts? Uh, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Does he recognise himself? He recognises my Freudian slips in the script, which is yeah. scary <laughs> and uh, revealing in a bad way. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that I would have the courage to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can go very close. I mean, like even Dollhouse, like, was a weird experience because I was pregnant. I was like seven months pregnant, right in my parents' house as a location, writing a story about a girl who breaks into her parents' house and has a baby on the floor. So I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> just go with it. But you were aware of that. Yeah, I was at least aware of it. The actors were not. Neither were my parents. <laughs> They've seen them. They've seen them. Um, that is something we could talk about as well, about your relationship with your father and writing. Yeah. I, I, didn't, we didn't, I didn't check this before. No, yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting because I suppose what I learned from him is like, um, it's probably much more important than like tips about screenwriting. You know, it's like, it's it's that vulnerability and that like being okay to be unmasked is, mm -hmm. is probably what I learned, you know. Um, um, and, you know, uh, he's like the same person on set taxi at home the exact same person um, and so that crazy childlike curiosity I suppose that he has is and and wonder and kind of always pulling at threads you know um, is yeah, but 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 I suppose it's having the um, uh, I don't know fearlessness I suppose to to just say this is me you know and, and that's it but that's that's kind of fun to watch i actually heard him at a talk years ago saying admitting he said that even the dog has my face <laughs> everybody remembers that <laughs> line. Yeah, everyone know. remembers that line good. yeah yeah really he had another good one. one that i really liked about character and he said um he said everyone says to me that's contradictory what your character just did and he's like Yes, humans are full of fucking contradictions. Like, I put five characters into a pot, I put the water in, I put the fucking gas up, the thing boils over, there's the fucking character. <laughs> like, Something has to happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who knows? Um, do people have any questions? Do you want to just pause for some questions? Yeah. We can do it. All right, we're, all, we're all over the place here. Yeah. Mm. Five women. My talk is too much about TV rather than feature. No, films. no, yeah. Doing uh, very, very well. well. Why don't, just as you were talking about in America, would you maybe talk a little bit more about what that was like to write with your dad and your sister yeah. about a story that was yeah. biographical? Or yeah, I mean, that's the funny thing, I suppose. You know, like, I mean, this is just so specific to me. I'm not sure how helpful it will, will be um, to just writing in general, but I suppose that story is, a, is um, whether you know, I don't know if people know, but. Um, we went to America and, and me, my, my two sisters, my, yeah, my two sisters and, and my mum and dad and all of that part of the film is 100% autobiographical and that was the easy part to write and then my dad brought in the death of his actual brother which happened when he was a kid into our story and so he became <laughs> every character. He became the father who can't let go of the kid and the death and he became the oldest daughter who feels like she's the one taking care of the family, you know, so, so that was kind of, <laughs> fascinating and and I mean in some ways we wrote a lot of that on improv um I would improv because Sam Morton was on Minority Report and she wasn't available so I would be pretending to be my mum with Paddy Considine <laughs> and my dad would be directing and I was pregnant with Leo my first child and so it was wow. very strange like every, like art imitates life has always been this weird kind of um uh, parallel track I guess in our family but the DNA of that story goes back to when my dad's brother died and my my grandfather couldn't deal with the um, emotion of it. And so to get him out of depression, he started a kids' theater drama group. And so he oh. brought all the emotion onto the stage where it was safe to express it and where nobody dies mm. because it's film or theater and art. And so that's what he did. And that then has been like this theme, this ongoing theme that, you know, 
is constantly passed down through all the work. So, so, but to answer the question in a more simple way, <laughs> um, we just wrote our own drafts, myself and my sister, so that he could see a kid's point of view and in separate countries at separate times. Um, and so he had that. Uh, it was almost like writing a diary. It was the easiest thing in the world to write. And then years later, we came back to it through the improvs and through... Mm. And that's how he finds story because he thrives in chaos in that way. So it was get the actors on their feet. It's a really interesting way to write because mm. if, you, if there's so many, like there's like every different type of actor, there's a hundred different types, there's a, six billion different types of actors and the same with writers, you know, and it's just which is your process, you know. Some people it's, you know, like a lot of people didn't come to the factory because they are the kind of people who will sit in a room with the door closed on their own and that's them you know and mm. and then there's ones who pick up the camera and need actors and write in that sense you know so yeah it's finding that process that works for you I think. So is that how it was written it wasn't sort of you writing scenes and bringing together it was no. more a group improvisation or sort of set up? Well it was the separate drafts that he kind of amalgamated into oh, right. into into that into his draft into the uber draft I suppose and then that was taken apart years later with the actors and put back together again and changed and you know and then taken apart again in the edit and reshot and yeah i've had a, you know, a sideline question really mm -hmm. memory did you have each of you have different memories of Oops. different oh events God, that you were writing about absolutely writing. absolutely and different truths you yeah, know exactly. which is scary because exactly. because yeah now my kids have different truths about me yeah. and i'm like that's not the truth <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. at all um, um, and we were just I was just watching Waltz with Bashir recently yeah. um, and there's a scene in that where they talk about memory being alive mm -hmm. um, rather than this fixed state so it's very kind of I don't know witchy <laughs> no, no it's very true yeah alive yeah. and growing and, yeah and, and malleable all the time, totally. yeah I mean there was an experiment with, that they did where they show people in a park and they go, I was never in that park. And you should put a photo of that person in the park and then you implant oh, keep asking yes, them, <laughs> you know, asking them how was the day in the park. And by the third time, they're telling you an entire story about the day they had at the park, you know, which is story, which is storytelling, I suppose, you know. Yeah. But I think you'll find, even through that, I guess art and writing and all that stuff is fiction, but you'll find, I guess, yourself and, and your own fact <clears throat> in there, you know, somehow, you know, even if you're making it up. It is. Sometimes it's interesting because I, I've, I've only just finished reading Educated by Tara Westover. So the memoir about her childhood on a farm in Idaho with very difficult parents, very difficult family situation. And she does talk at the end of the book about how she had to check. She, she rang brother, her brothers to check certain details she thought about various events okay. and dates and things. But actually they gave her a whole other point of view about certain yeah. ac accidents whether she was the one who treated her brother's burnt leg or whether her father had treated her brother's right. burnt leg. Like this like really, really um, opposite yeah. um, memories of the same yeah. event, you know. So that, I was curious about that in terms of in America, but I do think it's... Yeah, no, I mean, you know, my dad's quite funny about it because he'll be like, oh, I asked the kids to write their own version and they wrote me out, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, you weren't there. What are you talking about? It was mom. <laughs> so he was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so was of course, yeah, of course, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, I never attended a football match. Yeah. My <laughs> All of that's gold. Gold. Sunday yeah. morning, it's forgotten. Um, <clears throat> uh, there were some questions about like your career. Obviously, a career from outside looks different from when you're in it. You know? yeah. So you feel like you're still in just this constant struggle. And yeah. That, that does every, every actor, right, every writer I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. 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 Um, but other people talk about how, I do see it happen, I guess if someone has a, a first film, and either a general it's women, and it might be, you know, eight to ten years later before they get mm -hmm. another film. The first film could have been absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. When Winter's Bone um, launched Jennifer Lawrence, um, she won the Academy Award for that, I think. I think so, so nominated, mm -hmm. but, yeah. um, and then it's like eight years later before Deborah Crowner comes back to Leave No Trace, you know. Yeah. And for a lot of people who don't have the same memory of Winter's Bone, it's like she's just appeared again, you know, right. and like the first film again. Hmm. And uh, which to me just feels like a, it's a tragedy on two, yeah. two counts. One was because there could have been another film for us to enjoy in yeah. between. 
and that the, her, her the development of her career and her voice and 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 so on isn't a, isn't happening as it should. You know, and I presume in that time of her not getting a film off the ground, there's also she has to find money and pay the bills and, yeah. and do you know other things. Uh, and it's the same. I mean, I was talking to Deborah Regan of, of, the, of Screen Ireland, and she said it is. It's, it's absolutely it's difficult for them to uh, promote filmmakers right. and films and put them in the market if there's a long gap. It might as yeah, well be a first. your first. Film. And actually, not even your first, because your first, you, you, you're, oh, they're new. They're also full of promise and new voice and this new thing, and yeah. there's some heat and there's some. Yeah, so being, being a first film, I think, is easier than being a second or a third five or ten years later, and that's exactly the same as my trajectory, you know, it's huge gaps. They're not as big really? as some, though, no, okay. they're not too bad, they're quite respectable, really. <laughs> but I'm wondering if you, know, if you have any ideas about um, how one can... Well, actually, the first question is, did you ever sit back and look at your career in the beginning and think about how, what you wanted to do and what you wanted to be in a certain amount of time? Yeah. You did? What yeah. did you want to do? I still do that every day. Like. <laughs> <laughs> was it the very beginning? Like a disco thing? Where did you think um, the next God, step would be? I don't, I don't know. Um, but I suppose... It, it, I think you're one was clueless. I mean, I was quite clueless. I just kind of was blindly kind of going along. But but it was then maybe I would do an interview or someone would ask me a question like that, and I go, Oh God, yeah, wait a second, what happened there? Or like with August Rush, you know, that was like you go, Okay, well, it made money, and and you know, people certainly Americans liked it and all of that. But then you don't get offered anything, you know, and you're and, and then people are like. They're confused by that, and then that makes that made me go, oh, maybe I should have been, you know. And and so at the time, you're just kind of assuming that everything is is normal. Just but then, life. yeah. But then when you look back on it, you go, God, maybe that actually wasn't normal. Maybe I maybe I should have gotten offered other things at that point in my career that I didn't or whatever, you know. So it's a strange one. And you didn't expect things to come your way after all this rush. Was well, out. what came my way was maybe one or two options that were the exact same movie but worse. Yeah. So. <laughs> you do see a lot of that actually. Yeah. You know, like apparently I'm the um, you know crime writer at the moment. Okay. Yeah. 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 The yeah. The last few right. Months. Yeah. Exactly. And um, so you go. Like, gosh, war. Yeah. <laughs> come out. But I wanted to do a war film after all this first year. You know what I mean? Like just yeah, to break yeah. out of that box. But it was like no way. There's not a hope you're going to be able to do that. Did you think if you do you think there's any way to um, avoid that, you know? Being... I think it's getting a little better now. I think people are getting a little bit more open and not pigeonholing you, you know? Mm. A little. But I think that maybe the way to avoid it is, again, like to take my own advice that I would give to the actors and try and um, either write something or make something that, that, that refutes that, you know, and that kind mm. of pushes back on that somehow. And that's, you know, unfortunately probably spec scripts. <laughs> mm. <I was> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's one of those things you really need to have the next project in your pocket. Yeah, and yeah. anger can fuel ways. things. Yeah. <laughs> anger can be good, um, you know. Um, yeah, I think I think I mean the last the, the last spec <coughs> pilot that I wrote was pure. I think was was an anger thing, <laughs> and and it does it ends up getting you another job. So yeah, it works. Um. Okay, I think we did. If we could, I'm just going saying on that writing. I mean, we were talking about biopics as well. It was a little bit about in America, but then with your with all of you involved, you were actually in a, in in one way also in control of the representation of the, yeah. your family story. But if you your biopics like Old Corbett and Amy Winehouse and yeah. approaching that, how did you approach writing about real people? Um, I think it's very, very delicate, you know, because on the one hand, you've got this commitment to these real life people and that feels very, you feel a lot of responsibility mm. to that, I think. But I think, I personally think that I, I wouldn't ever write a biopic unless I was, on, like, I have to be completely in love with the person to write it. All right. In, in a way, because I think, you know, you have to be with, like, I wouldn't ever be able to do a biopic that, that takes a person and goes in a direction that they don't want to go. So I kind of have to know that from the start, you know, that there's enough there to mine down and get a story out of it without 
adding in stuff that's really not true to who they are, you know. Over to my, you know, so my yeah. stuff more dramatic. I or guess. whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you say love the person, do you mean love the real person or love the person that you've come across in, in terms of various forms of media? Uh, the real one, I think, yeah. 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 So to it, meet them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, like, obviously, if you're doing a, a biopic on someone who's long gone, like, it's it's a different thing, and you can only, <laughs> you can only do so much, and, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky, though, I think, you know, because you're really representing something very, um, you know, I have a big problem with uh, those those uh, advertisers who take dead people and, and make them into advertisements, you know? Like, I think it, it should, it's like a crime punishable by death as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I think it's just so fundamentally wrong. But I guess that's the estate saying that's okay or something, you know? I don't know, but, but, but then at the same time, maybe I'm a hypocrite because I, I wrote about Cleopatra. The fuck do I know what Cleopatra <laughs> thought, you know? But yet I, like, uh, did as much research as, as, as one could. But, um... Yeah, so it's it's a tricky thing, I think, you know. I was saying it's interesting though, if you're talking about um see, you could you could want to represent someone in a certain way and it, and you may think it's completely truthful. Exactly. But what if they took but what if they so took? <laughs> yeah. I mean I suppose I've been lucky in that any biopic uh character subject that I've been involved in kind of is able to to go deep and, and show themselves warts and all and, and all of that kind of thing and and we've been in, in in a real parallel track, you know, with that. Mm. Um, so I would I wouldn't like to be in a situation where there's conflict there. I think it'd be too painful. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I think no, it's I to be avoided, you know. Um, yeah, um, and that can happen. That's happened with books more specifically. I think you know, mm. like I've adapted a few books where uh, the advice was to not go hand in hand with the original author, mm. and that's a mistake. I think. Especially if they have this power over the yay or nay that it gets made. <laughs> That's a big mistake. Um, because you obviously go so far and you have to take 10 steps, but they have to take those baby steps with you along the way to realize why you made those choices, you know. So I think that can be tricky. It be really difficult, I think, with it, you know, for novelists to see their stories. Absolutely. Completely. Yeah, out of the blue and not realize why you made those choices yeah, to get yeah, there. Yeah. Necessary choices, yeah. I think. Yeah. Two different mediums. Yeah. Um, and when you're, uh, actually there's, a, there's another quote that I came across that was about structure and you said, uh, you felt essentially, like this is real paraphrasing, that you, you had a deal to structural rules in your time and eventually you, you gained enough confidence or knowledge to, to um, discard yeah. structure. And then, then this also relates to what you were saying about children recognizing yeah. the various plot points and yeah. the story tricks because they're yeah. all the same. You can go and buy the book and, and uh, yeah. put it together, and that's very hard to very hard to avoid when development executives come back at you with those. You yeah, know, you're page thirty. You have, I know you have to be you know, careful. I think because if 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 you're writing and and development execs can actually sway you, you know, if you're if the, if someone asks a question like, "What's the motivation for this character's?" big action on page 50 can't we plant it in the first 10 you kind of like logically you should say yes and that's what you should do but that kind of it's logic that doesn't work you know what I mean yeah so like I think you start learning that logic is is kind of bullshit in the same way that you know you put all those characters into a pot and boil it over and there's a person you know like full of contradiction you know because an emotional logic Yes, and exactly. exactly. You know, it surprises you, but it does feel true. Yeah. yeah. And I was in a pitch recently, and they were saying, so this character, I was pitching this, like, abs like what I think is an absolute kick-ass, crazy, like, anti-hero, hero woman who has many, many uh, dodgy traits and all of these things. And, you know, the development sec was like, well, what was the moment in her childhood where this, oh, and I was just like, <laughs> and they just actually launched at her. And, and 10 years ago, I would have thought on my feet and said, well, there was a moment when, <laughs> you know, but I was like, no, that's, that's, that's total bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I was saying, she's still molding herself, this character. That's the point, you know what I mean? She's made of clay. <laughs> and they were like, ooh, we're not picking this up. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> Do you think that's true, Molly, with her, that they want I know, to I follow do. the rules? Sometimes, or? but it, get, it, go, it goes back to, I guess, who are you pitching to, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so if you're lucky and you have someone who's who's willing to maybe let you go out on a limb a little bit, but I think that's, 
there was a very depressing but also very good Writers Guild. Uh, there's two, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody gets uh, subscriptions, if you can, to the Writers, uh, the WGA uh, magazine. It was really good. And maybe we should kind of like ask them if we could do our own version and pull their articles, you know. Oh, no, for, for, for Rich? For, yeah, for, or for any, for the Guild here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there was two great articles. One was about um, was about pitching, and it was the guy who, who wrote The Night Of, which is fantastic. Oh, 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 Steve Zaley, and I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said, <laughs> which is awful, he said, um, you can be sh you can walk in with a Shakespearean level idea, and it <laughs> does not matter if it's who's in the room with you. <laughs> which is a real kind of, it, it helps in some ways, because you're like, okay, I better just... I better package up before I go in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one was it was the transparent writer Jill Soloway, and she said everybody says like, uh, "Don't cry at work, don't cry at work." And she was like, "If you're in my writer's room, you cry every day <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I want on the page, you know." Yeah. So it's a whole flip side idea that that she had, you know. What were we talking about? Because it was a different point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I just want to know, but you did remind me. I also think it depends who's in the room, but it also depends who. Um, what they're looking for. Yeah. So I, yeah. Found, I found in pitching, I've walked, I've, like I've walked into the open door, you know, where right. they want, they want, they're actively looking for the thing that I'm just about to pitch. Yeah. And I, you know, I can say about three words and like they go, yes, great. Yeah. Have you got, you know, have you got to yeah. down, you hand it over and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, yeah. that, that was working title. That was like right. one of the best things. But, I, but it made me really, really conscious. Luck and timing, you know, is huge. Yeah. But they will only um, bear fruit if you've done the work and you've got yourself in the room in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So the luck and timing can't be underestimated. And actually, there's a book that just reminded me of, and speaking of Shakespeare, but there's a book by Ted Hughes called uh, Shakespeare and the Goddess of Complete Being, which is out of print now, but it's an incredible book about how Shakespeare had this split subject of he was the one person who, who well, was trying to like make the goddess whole again rather than split her into mother maiden crone oh, yeah, yeah. you know um and it's a it's a really fascinating book but what it also says is that he was lucky in his own way because his personal story matched up perfectly with the split that was happening in in in, in society at the time between catholic and protestant you know and so it's this really fascinating idea of whatever your internal story is if it's matching up with something that's happening in the zeitgeist, like you're you're golden, you know. Yeah. But it's impossible to force that, so it's very tough. No, it know? is. It's, well, it's the same thing about pitching. And when they say, "Well, actually, no, we're not interested. No, we already have one of those." Do yeah. you have a <laughs> supernatural series? Right? Yeah. Because like Misfits is doing really well. Yeah. And you go, and you go. If I start working on that now, having spent the three months yeah. there and start pitching it, It'll and then gone. we make it, yeah, 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 we'll be over It'll that. We'll be over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's already too late. Yeah. Um, I think it just uh, well questions again. I'm glad to go back to screenwriting. And any yes, just when you're in LA as well as writing, are you directing as well? No, but actually, I know a, a lot of friends of mine are. Um, a lot of Irish women, which is great. Steph Green is is doing a lot. She's going from show to show to show, which is hard graph. So she directed Running <coughs> Jump? Yeah, she yeah, directed yeah, Running Jump. It's really beautiful. And it's, it's right now, like, my agents are like, direct! Like, you know, there's a moment and you should do it, and it just doesn't happen to be what I want to do. I think Ashling Walsh, I think Dervla Walsh, like, there's a lot of, there is a lot of opportunity for in the, mm. in the directing mm. space, specifically mm. in TV, but um, I have three kids, and so I chose to stay and do that in just in my writing bubble, you know? But, but I suppose the the options for me would be more like join a writer's room of a show um, at whatever level, uh, a show that you love and can bring something to, or just keep going on the individual pitches, which is kind of feels like winning the lottery, you know what I mean? Uh, <coughs> it's, it's quite a high bar. Um, or, um, I mean, commissions on features seems to be getting thinner and thinner and thinner every, mm. every day, so that's... Um, you know, they, they're so jealous of us that we have the film board. Like, they're like, what? You know, they, they, they can't get it into their head, that concept. So I guess we have to look at it <laughs> in a good way there. Yeah. yeah. There's, that, there's a little bit about what you're saying about you made, you made a choice because of your family and you want to be available to them. Like I, I have another friend who's, who's directing and 
essentially her husband, Australian, had they moved to LA. He had to give up everything. He's, he's a house husband. Right. He has been for years. And he really wants to go back because he's a trained barrister. Right. right. <laughs> but she feels like she's put so much work into her career that she did the handmaid's tale and so on. Oh, that, right. um, that she wants to stay. And because it is where the best work is. Yeah. But sometimes it just feels impossible to be a parent and to work in this industry. And I do say parent because I think there's a similar problem for yeah. men these days as well. Yeah. Um, and and people, I, there are some people I've talked to about it, and they have this kind of blanket approach to the set and the idea that you could change anything about how films are actually made to be able to accommodate parents mm -hmm. or the school day mm -hmm. or set up a crash for a production, mm -hmm. you know, for a period mm -hmm. of time. You know, whether, you know, it's up to the parents' choice, whether they want to move a child around, but mm -hmm. surely so it's just a young offering baby. the choice, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of like the quota conversation. I think exactly. it has, it has it's to all be forced. Together. Yeah, <laughs> it can't be a choice because it will never happen otherwise. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, it has to be mandated somehow from somebody in power. Whether that's an individual on a show who does something and then everyone goes wow, and then they follow suit, you know, or or whether it's a governmental, <clears throat> you know, political law abiding mandate, you know. But yeah, it's, it's <laughs> well, I I think it is really basically about saying that they're. Um, a film set or a TV set is a working environment for everybody, mm -hmm. right? And at the moment, it, it's, um, it's it's far more suited to men. I mean, mm -hmm. I've actually had I've had a male director say he still didn't really feel it was a place for women because somehow it was about you know like being um, um, soldiers, you know, like backing to the top of the hill oh. together. Oh, oh God. God. you know, <laughs> now he's a lovely man. Oh. <laughs> We had an argument. But to an extent, it, it, it's hard to imagine how equal the scenario can be um, while this, while <coughs> films are made in that way. Yeah. Even if we give demand to quality, there's still this. So Time. women choosing, like choosing to have families. You know, the, in the thirties, it's kind of it's a period of time. You either do it or you don't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and actually, probably my I don't my children are so much on for part of my life. But but if 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 someone really wanted to be, um, you know, a film director, writer, director, author, a woman, I'd probably advise them not to have children. If they were ever hesitating at all, I think the choice in terms of developing career, the way things are now, mm -hmm. I mean, practically, you're off not. yeah. Like, it's like left brain, right brain, you know? Like, my right brain is like, no, children will make you a much better writer because exactly. you're, you've all these experiences. And then my left brain is like, yeah, good advice, you yeah. know? Because <laughs> it's also the age thing. You come up against the age thing. So you've yeah. in the last 10 years. Um, but what do you think is more likely to happen? Like, quotas or um, eight hour working days <clears> on a film set? Oh, my God. I think, like, you'd yeah. have to be in quite a position of power, I guess, to, to insist upon it, you know what I mean? It's a tough one, I think, you know. I would much prefer if 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 it had to be insisted upon, you know, like you have that backup. It's like having a union backup really, isn't it? Yeah. Like you can have all the will in the world and then still like let everybody and yourself down by not going that direction, you know? But if, if you have the union saying, No, that's just the way it is, you have to, it's like, okay, great. You kinda of want someone to actually say that, you know? I was just imagining <laughs> strike. Yeah, like in Iceland, all of them yeah. walked off every film on TV. So right, right, right. Like, or know, every writer's room. For a start, looking for an eight hour, eight hour working day, you know, so you yeah. can manage childcare. Yeah. At least. Um, I mean, I just have to bring my kids with me to set, you know, and I'm lucky that they're all interested in it, you know. But the eight year old, you know, that'll be, not, you know, it's harder for him to be serene. How cerebral. old are they now? Uh, 16, 11, and 8. All right, so, so the other two, kind of yeah. Pass, but there's a period of time is very difficult to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and Kristen, can you speak a little bit about the writing? So the process, are you pulled from character to story, from your issue, shoehorn that back in, like as you go along nine to five or nine to three, Monday to Friday, what what what's your actual process? Like say whether it's feature film or, or TV drama. 
I'll answer this and you tell me if this is if this answers it because I'm I, it, it, there might be like three separate answers to that. Mm -hmm. um, but the, my process is very specifically research for like two months, like a long time, and immerse in everything, and then I end up with like a hundred page document that might have like uh, YouTube clips, music, uh, characters from other movies, lines, uh, you know, characters with ideas from <coughs> my own life, and it's all in this one huge unwieldy doc document. And then I break that document down into like a master 20 page kind of, these are my greatest hits, you know, <laughs> of what I need. These are the things that are coming up strongest. In terms of the story narrative or in, in terms, terms of, of just everything, probably everything, like the entire project as one thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, like the world it's in, the characters, the structure. Then I, and then I do have a separate structure document <coughs> that's much more uh, boom, 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 you know, and that changes based on this. 20 page kind of mad thing you know and then I procrastinate until <laughs> the very last two weeks totally and my husband goes because oh, the, the, there's two weeks where I, there's a deadline in two weeks and I will write 16 hours a day in those two weeks and for the week before that I just stare at the wall <laughs> and that's the same every single time and he just goes Could you, is there no balance and I say, oh. yeah. so that's just my process but I think everyone's is different or? I think how much <laughs> well, I know when I need to write when I'm picking out drain hair with a tweezers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every time I write that, oh yeah, it's that time. <laughs> <laughs> and can I just jump in? Where does I don't know? Would that be just for like when you're going for hire or no idea? Anything, all of it. So where does the initial? This is the one. Um, how does that? Or, as in like how to pick projects, kind of thing. Or for yourself, how like what makes you go? This is what I'm going to spend the next x amount of months working on like what is that i mean sometimes it's really practical you know what i mean like like i read a book and get the rights and then like you have an option period so you have to jump on it do you know what i mean or or there's a commission and you have to jump on it but but uh it's much harder to answer that question when you when you've no necessity you know what i mean when <laughs> when you're just like what should I do that? like that's a really hard question i think you know it's, it's almost so big that it will stop you yeah. <laughs> from doing anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, I guess I was kind of, the last thing I did, I was like, oh, I really need to show that I can do a half hour comedy. So then yeah, I was so like, okay, right. now, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now how will I do that? Um, so, so that's probably, um, and then, you know, it, it, it comes from 400 different places, I think, you know, it could um, also be like, wow, we need a female character who's X now, you know, like let's stop having the female lead have to have revenge because of a rape situation. Things like that, you know what I mean? You're going, okay, so how do I then not do that? What does that look like? Who is she? Where she come from? All of those kind of things, you know? So I think it probably comes from like so many different places. But but like Lauren said, like, you know, you're not even sure at the time. You're like, should I spend three months on this? And then like when you're a month in, you're like, no. And then when you're two months in, you're like, yes. <laughs> There's that really silly, you know, that one? It's a meme. It's really true. It's like, this is shit. I am shit. This is not bad. This is great. I'm a genius. This is shit. Um, I do think there's also an element, and you just identified it there, where the, in choosing the project to focus on, it's also keeping in mind where it might go. And if it's sort of you can see an easier, That's an, an open door somewhere, yeah. like someone's asking or looking That's for it. Yeah, absolutely. Then that might be the one to contemplate. And actually, around. agents can sometimes be good on that. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, exactly. I'd be like, what about mine? They'd be like, ooh, you know, that's. That's whatever. There's just exactly that. I just I, read ten. Yeah, just like that. yeah, yeah. So you go, okay. Well, I think mine was still, but I'm going to put it on ice for five years. You know. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I have two questions. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> just on the agents thing. Do you have different agents for different facets of your work, and how does that work? What is beneficial and what is not? And then just reflecting on um, your work, obviously in so many different forms. Are there any mistakes that you've made or things that you would avoid or, or wish you'd done anything differently? Like just specifics or Yeah. Um so the agent thing, I did have a, a UK agent, but then when I moved to America there wasn't much point in having a UK agent. So I have I have an American T V agent and an American film agent at UTA, but I also have an Ameri two managers and anonymous content. Um so they're quite different uh, relationships, but you know, I think agents, it's like, it's
it's kind of like any relationship. Like I, I went into it thinking, oh, you're going to get something for me, but it's not actually the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as much as you'd like it to be, you know, it's it's very much um, when it goes quiet and cold. It's like any relationship. You go, how do I get this back on track? What can I give them? Even though you don't, you kind of feel like, fuck that. You know what I mean? Like, I should be getting, they should be calling me with a job offer. But unfortunately, I don't think that's actually the relationship. But people think that's the relationship. So the expectations are here when you go into it. And unmeetable, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you just get constantly disappointed. So um, to stay in, in their, um, to stay alive in their head, you know, it's really like any relationship. What can you bring to the table? And you're kind of going, but I'm bringing everything. <laughs> aren't you going to make phone calls or whatever but you know when it goes into that quiet space I would do something like okay I have to I have to show them that I can X and I'll do something and I'll send it and it will give it a bit more life again you know um, so yeah it's, it's, it's very much a giving thing I think that's the only way it works you know um, and then you know you do end up getting your own jobs a lot yeah of course a lot, so, you know, you've worked with people yeah and yeah yeah, so I was gonna say I always say it's about it's like making you're the person who makes chairs and sometimes you make a chair with your own design, sometimes someone asks you to make a chair because they quite like the chair that you made. Mm -hmm. And your agent is there to sell your chairs. Yeah. You know, and they might be able to tell someone that actually I think she's really good at making chairs, but if they haven't actually got once yeah. chair, I'm really no, no, it's true. yeah. <laughs> but essentially you have to give your agent something to sell. Uh, and otherwise they can sell you a little bit but that only lasts if you're really on yeah. period of time and there's such specific things you know if you're like okay I'm going to give you <laughs> actually a friend of mine Caroline Moran, actually the actress you know she was talking about actors and she was like it's literally like having cars they're like hmm like agents and actors so maybe it's similar with writers they're like I have a red Ferrari and I have my Ford Focus and I have this like you know she'd be literally like you know I have my Irish brunette and who's in her 30s yeah, yeah. and I have my so so it's quite it's quite hard to get out of those boxes you know but in a weird way it's like if you you have to present yourself huh, i have to do this everybody has to do these things like uh, what's your 30 second elevator pitch on yourself <laughs> like, oh, 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 oh my god but it's an interesting exercise to do you know it really is um <laughs> and whether you have to ever say it or, or not is, is another thing and of course it's going to shift and change and everything yeah. but for that moment in time and if that lines up with with something that's sellable for them that's a good thing you know and um, does that answer the question yeah. at all <laughs> um and then the other one was what was the other one just like oh, mistakes yeah yeah it's like question. millions but um but at the same time like this is the thing it's like the practical side of the head and then the zen thing well i wouldn't be who i am today in my head <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah like so many like <laughs> where do i say she can want to meet after. <laughs> we have a few glasses of wine. I'll be crying. <laughs> Opportunities for journey. Oh, but yes, that's it. Yeah. Oh, that's it. What's the best advice you've been given? Or, or the advice you were never given and you wish you had, but you have learned? I mean, some of it is that very practical stuff. I mean, the best advice I've been given is all that philosophical end of it. You know what I mean? I'm not sure about practicality is the best advice I've ever been given. <laughs> I don't think, uh, I mean, I read an awful lot of, like I, I read like just every book on screenwriting and every book on and all the ma all the magazine articles and go to all the talks and you always get one gem out of all of them you know I think it, it, there's like you read 100 pages and you only get one gem so there's quite a lot of work involved but um practically speaking I mean like I say I wish I, I actually kind of wish that my agents had said when I moved to LA, <coughs> this is this option start in the writer's room this is this other option this is this other option you know just that macro view is very yes, hard I mean, to get the career path yeah that's very hard to get i think you know because you're in the weeds so much you know it involves a level of ambition and confidence as well like to, yeah to, to stand back look at yourself yeah in the industry and work out how you're going to get yeah to where you want to go and, and staying focused on that i think really yeah. important and i mean you know it makes me think for some reason of lenny all of a sudden in my head and room and i think <coughs> we were talking about this I think that's why it's in my head but I, you know I would always say to actors like um write a personal letter if you want the job you know what I mean yeah. and, and they oh, might not get read or they might blah, blah, blah. I'm like it doesn't matter write the most personal letter you possibly can and that's what I've done to get jobs and that's what I think Lenny might have done we did. Did. that's why it's in my head yeah um, and other 
writers that I know, you know, and directors, and, and you just go out on a limb, and that, that letter can take a full day of really <coughs> thinking it through and mine and deep, and, you know, but you, you kind of, it's the same thing with the agent. You have to put all of that out there to expect to any kind of thing to come back at all, you know? To get any connection, because especially yeah. if, if you're at working at that level, there'd be a whole lot of other people doing <coughs> exactly the same yeah. thing, and they'll come with a lot more money. Yeah. So mm. to pitch yourself and pitch really strongly and personally yeah. is really important. I also was, say to go back again. Yeah. Just check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. ask. Yeah. Always. Just ask. You yeah. Because you've really got nothing to lose at yeah. a certain point in time. And things go so quickly off the boil, especially over there. Yeah. You know, there's like, oh, the magazine article and everybody's pitching for it. And it's, you know, someone buys it for seven figures. And then you go, what's happening with that? Absolutely nothing. You know, it was the hottest yeah. thing, of, yeah. you know, that month. And then you go back and kind of start chipping away again, you know. <coughs> But, you know, and, and it can absolutely fail. <laughs> like, I had a thing recently where I fell in love with a book and approached the writer and found out that he would want a, a Muslim woman to direct it and then got a Muslim woman director who's absolutely fantastic and then did a pitch and got my manager to produce it, anonymous content, and went back and had the conference calls and bought him... Um, Irish chocolate. <laughs> we brought that to the meeting because yeah. <laughs> he hadn't tasted it before and all of that. And yeah, he didn't get the job. <laughs> but they'll you know. remember you. Actually, they might come back. Yeah, you know, I can go back. You sort of with, you know, think of you for something else. Yeah, I'll go back. Um, <laughs> we just, yeah, just coming to the end of more questions. Though. Can I just ask you if you think there's a fashion um, that's very current about optioning and, and it has to, like, there seems to be loads of really good dramas with female characters and women directors and it's all good in that sense but they've all been written already as books is that is that what's happening as opposed to original material oh god that is a huge yeah. thing yeah i mean that's <coughs> because they can point to a graphic novel or a best-selling book or a documentary like i actually started advising friends of mine to write their story as a new yorker article because it and i'm trying to get it in the new yorker and they, these are people who would have no traction with, it, with it, a feature film or a, and like, I don't know if any, if anyone has agents, but there's ways to, um, there's like, I get sent on a Friday, uh, things to, things to watch and it's manuscripts that haven't been published yet. And it's <clears throat> New Yorker articles and it's, you know, it pulls from everywhere, graphic novels. And, and I read the whole list and then I say, can I read these three? And they send me those three and then <coughs> it, it goes on from there, you know? So, so but th that that is a trend that will continue i think absolutely you know so it's either like you, you can point to these are the things that um we already know that there's an audience for you know so <laughs> that's pretty logical or it feels more like the personal you're selling yourself like the same way that you know uh phoebe would sell herself in Fleabag as much and, and I know she's a she's an actress as well so it's a different thing but mm. but as a writer you can <coughs> you can position yourself as that writer you know she's the one who blabbed but you have to figure out what the blab is <laughs> that's the hard part. Your brand is. yeah 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 it and is it's a dirty word but it's it's but it's true you know? it is true for, for anything I don't know, like director or anything you're doing really but um, I have heard that like, there, there was an executive development executive element like a year or two ago said said to some um, writers here in a development course that they'd be better off, honestly, that they would be better off writing their script, screenplays as a book first. And short stories. Published and then coming back yeah. to them. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And it's not even, I mean, it's maybe not even the best selling thing. It's like, can I read this and there's a story there and there's a there's <coughs> something there, there's a voice there. And then I do think you have more power, you know? Like yeah. I talk with a lot of writer friends and they're like, I'm going to, you know, that script from 10 years ago that I love that I'm like, yeah, it's a great script. I'm going to rewrite it as a novel now. And you go, okay, to get some traction, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. That's or a to, major to commitment. Finished, <laughs> you know? That too. To, to complete. Yeah. Um, are yeah. there any more questions? Or is that, I'm, I'm going to wind up. If don't have I mean, I don't know if you're going to ask, Lauren, you probably were just what you're working on right now and what you can tell us <laughs> about what you're working on right now. Um, I'm, I'm working on a pitch for working title, um, which is a half hour comedy um, about uh, veterans, <laughs> which is really interesting actually because they're a group of people who, like America is so divided right now and they're the only group of Americans I've met who are not divided based on any political belief whatsoever. 
There's no division. And so it's, it's amazing because you go, wow, there's this crazy, strange little utopia that goes on with this unbelievable bond, you know? So that's just an interesting thing to explore right now because my goal right now is to do a show that is truly bipartisan. <laughs> and that's a weird thing to say because it's a half hour comedy, but that's what's underneath that. That's the, that's the push underneath it. Um, it's actually a very political push underneath it or anti <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to staff right on a show, uh, a Showtime show. Yeah, which I can't say what it is. <laughs> yes! Um, couple of classes. Um, and then just the other 15 projects, you know, every day you look at them and you go, how can I inch this one up the hill another tiny bit yeah. this boulder, you know? Yeah. Something about the veterans. It, that's a great pitch because it's like, I can't think of many other series like that. I can't yeah, series that. and they're also so cliche. Comedy about yeah. veterans, for God's sake. I mean, they're all, they're all, they're all so like, you know, SEAL team or, or crazy homeless guy. Like there's, yeah, there's yeah, very yeah. Little, little in between. And there's an incredible, one of the best books I've ever read called Tribe, which is Sebastian Younger's point of view about war and, mm. and, and society. And it's really small. So, so like just things like that. There's like just huge inspiration from that. But you just don't know. Like you could go and pitch that show, and they could go, you know, veterans only make up one percent of the American population. You're done. You know, you just don't know. So, so yeah, yeah. Um, fast forward ten years. I know some of us may not even be here. <laughs> <laughs> but if we did fast forward, you were back here ten years time chatting to us, and we said. What would you like to be able to tell us had happened, the best thing that could happen career-wise to you? If you just had your big wish, what would it be? Um, I honestly, actually, at this point in time, it would it would actually be my own TV show, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's that simple. Um, and <coughs> that's, again, the pie eating contest. Yeah. That I'd be like, why did I wish for that? I'm yeah. so yeah. nauseous yeah. right yeah. now. Do you have a pension? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, true. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. The Writers Guild are very good for yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I say thank you. Thank, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you.